Dean of the Derner Institute at Adelphi, uh, the system-wide Dean of California School of Professional Psychology at Lyon International University, uh, President and CEO Services, Regional Director, Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnership. Currently, her work on leadership, diversity, and women's issues has led to a number of uh, talks and publications in these areas, and during the past year, she has been invited to the Oxford Roundtable to talk on women in leadership and was designated as a Fulbright specialist in this area. And I understand that she'll be in Hong Kong next year to uh, actually do an investigation of leadership, uh, international leadership. Academically, she's trained psychologists and healthcare professionals in all sorts of diagnoses, treatment of emotional problems in community health care delivery, and has played a major role in the development of culturally competent training, curricula, and service delivery models for diverse populations. Um, <clears throat> as an Asian American psychologist, she was the first Asian American to be licensed in Massachusetts, and has been the first female in a number of her leadership roles. She has received many, many awards for her leadership and her work. She has also worked within the American Psychological Association to promote attention to clinical practice and ethnic minority issues through Divisions 12, 29, 35, 45, and the general APA governance. She's currently the president of Division 45 this year, which I think is a division for cultural diversity. Uh, yeah. 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 Right. Um, I first met Dr. Chen during her years when she was president of NCSPP, which is the National Council of Schools of Professional Psychology, of which our program is a member program. It was my first year as director and her year as president, and I actually got to sit next to her on our flight back from Mexico in January, so I picked her brains about how you run a program. Um, I'm very pleased to have her join us today to talk about dilemmas and debates for the future of psychology training. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a challenge with the podium in terms of it's too high, and, and <laughs> so we try to establish a compromise. Where now it's a little low, but at least I can over it, so that, uh, so that I will uh, talk from here. Today I'll focus on specifically on the issues of professional psychology training in the era of a thousand flowers and the dilemmas and challenges for the future. You know, how we got here or came to, this is based on an article in the uh, Training and Education uh, of Professional Psychology Journal, and it was published in um, 2011. 2011, and uh, it followed from the uh, 2009 Presidential Summit that was held by APA President James Bray on the future of psychology practice, which was an important one in terms of the task of that summit was to create a new vision for the practice of professional psychology. And essentially, the, uh, the, the big takeaway message you know, there was that um, psychology, by the time you graduate, is going to be very different from how you know it now. And that how then do you, are you prepared to practice in the future when there are the highlights of technology, of, um, of um, integrated uh, care, health care reform, and all those things are in place. And in, in that discussion, we then said, in, in those discussions during that summit, we then uh, said, it's not just what you know, all the issues of practice, but how do we train? How do we train psychology, professional psychologists to be prepared for the uh, future? of where psychology practice is going. So that um, who we are, the, the, uh, those of us who wrote the article were, uh, I was president of NCSPP at the time, uh, which is the training council, but we were all educators within the field of professional psychology and each of us who wrote that article, was about six of us, we each represented different aspects of professional psychology training. Each of us came from different training councils, and but we shared some common concerns about preparing psychologists to serve the public within the practice of professional psychology. So that, um, so so that was I keep going back to you. And so the challenges as we started to write this article was that um, we found that we were disagreeing 
we found that we, we didn't share some of the same persuasions, you know, um, and as we talked further, we realized that the areas of disagreement really represent the key dilemmas or challenges that aren't yet resolved in the field to begin with. And these are the things that you will hear or probably, and probably have heard in which programs, you know, and uh, people of different orientations and, and perspectives end up uh, challenging one another and creating factions about this is better, that's not, you know, and so on. And, uh, and that's what I'll get into in terms of the key dilemmas. And we outlined those dilemmas and came up with eight of them as we experienced it and how we felt that they needed to be addressed in terms of a field that we were seeing as splintered. You know, so, um, and we felt that addressing these challenges provides the fertile ground for a new synthesis within professional psychology training and that we weren't prepared to come up with the solutions because if you don't know what it is going to be, how can you have a solution for what you don't know? So that's why uh, we pose them as dilemmas. And essentially in terms of the future of training then, is we look at psychology as a discipline that's conceptualized currently in silos. You know, with science and practice as the most visible and often the most in conflict. So um, as a PsyD program, that it's also been pitted against the PhD programs. As a PsyD program, the scholar model, practitioner scholar model, is often pitted against the science practitioner models. And that, uh, and that we, we felt also that trainees are, are currently learning the theories and techniques that are gonna be different and will change over the course of your time in practice. And because we couldn't predict the future, we can only prepare trainees to continue to be mindful of the growing evidence base and I underscore the bottom of the public that we serve. So that, the, oops, did I change something? Yeah. Don't quite know how to. <laughs> I thought I was turning on the, uh, the red. Uh, pointers on the top. The, the pointers on the top? Okay, got it. So, so that. You know, and I put that the public, I understood that, which I will talk about in a bit, is because oftentimes when we look at uh, clinical psychology, professional psychology, the emphasis is not on the public, the emphasis is on individual, and looking at how do we train psychologists to work with individuals. So this notion of the public, which was one that all of us, in terms of the training councils, felt are important. Because if you look at licensure, Licensure is protection of the public. You know, so, uh, so the key questions that we then pose and raise is, uh, are we a science or are we a field of practitioners? Is our focus going to be the individual or do we have community mission? And if you look at the origins in terms of clinical psychology, it has been more emphasis on the individual. Um, and it's only in the 60s that it moved to looking at community-based uh, mental health and, and so on. But how do we prepare students to be to go into private practice and move into private practice? What is the uh, larger uh, community public uh, public health uh, mission? And what's our role in healthcare settings at schools? You know, with uh, healthcare reform that is <coughs> ominously present. Uh, and will uh, we'll, something will take place, what we don't know is exactly what it will be. It's going to expand the role of psychologists uh, in the healthcare setting, whether we want it or not. And uh, we need to be thinking about what we want it to be. So that um, the other is the whole area of specialty areas. You know, is that uh, what are the specialty areas in the province of psycho professional psychology and should these interact? So APA, for example, is dealing with that in terms of defining specialties. And one of the things that came up um, a couple of years ago is the question of should multiculturalism and diversity be considered a specialty? And um, 
in order, because there are competencies that one needs to know if you're going to deal with uh, diverse populations. And there was a lot of controversy over that. To the, and ultimately, those within multicultural psychology decided, no, it was not in the best interest to make diversity and multiculturalism a specialty because that essentially then silos it to the extent that we believe that uh, it's a generic overarching issue that needs to be included in one's training and one's competence in order to be uh, you know, a competent uh, practitioner provider. So that but there was a, a large uh, push at one point to consider it a specialty. And then what's the level of training appropriate for professional psychologists of the future? And what that means is that is that the doctoral level the level of entry or not? So one of the dilemmas I'll speak to is a bit about that. And then what's the role of money in education and training and practice? And that uh, uh, often those of us who go into this profession are saying we don't care about the money. But at the same time, when you have debt loads that amount to about $100,000 by the time you graduate, money matters if you don't, can't get a job, if you can't uh, uh, garner a salary that's going to help you pay it off um, within uh, a reasonable amount of time instead of over your entire lifetime. So that uh, money does play importance, but you know, how do you weigh those kinds of issues? So those are our key questions. And outline here then the eight key dilemmas, and I won't read them because I'll talk about them, you know, one by one, and that um, hopefully it will inspire certain questions, comments, considerations that you all will have that we can discuss in, you know, in a uh, in, in a Q and A, you know, following that. So the first, uh, but before we talk about those dilemmas, is let's we all felt it was important to start off with. Who are we as psychologists? And the identity of us as psychologists was crucial to the process that we engaged in in writing this paper, but we felt it was essential in those of you reading and hearing you know, what those dilemmas are and grappling with those dilemmas. And in psychology, we have a tradition of letting a thousand flowers bloom. That comes from uh, Ludi Benjamin's paper back in 2000 or 2001, in which he talked about psychology as letting a thousand flowers bloom. And how that plays itself out is that APA is cautious about setting specific accrediting standards for training programs in professional psychology. In other words, instead of as other professions like psychiatry, medicine, and so on, that says, this is what you need to do to be a physician. This is what you need to do to be trained in this area. Psychology pro training programs have to define its training model. APA does not say this is what the training model is. And then uh, to be accredited, psychology pro training programs have to define what your model is and then provide the evidence to show that you're in fact training the way you say you're supposed to do it. And the biggest spread between, or dichotomy between that are the science practitioner models and the scholar practitioner models. Uh, okay. So that, um, and the, uh, you know, and it, 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 those differences, there's many variations of each of those models, but the, the, the biggest uh, dilemma is it ends up being Eating, siloed, and separated. And that um, I assume that as a PsyD program, you would be a scholar practitioner model. <clears throat> so there are many training, because that people reverse it, then you are a practitioner scholar model, model, or you're just a scholar model, or you're just a practitioner model. I'm not going to go into all those different kinds of variations and what it means, but your, your training program director uh, must define what it means, no matter what term they you know, should choose. So that, and the tension inherent in all of this is the tension between studying the mind by introspective reasoning 
which is more characteristic in terms of theory, theoretical orientations related to psychodynamic theory than as opposed to empirically based science, which uh, is more characteristic in terms of those who espouse more the CBT you know, orientation. So it's a difference between meaning making and measurement as an important dichotomy. And there's often a lot of arguments about which is better, you know, and we have uh, these efficacy studies and outcome studies and meta analyses that have demonstrated uh, and test proved one is better than the other. And in fact, the most recent though that I see is there's been a demonstration of no difference. I was just at a talk yesterday that uh, in which the outcome has shown no difference between uh, uh, psychodynamic theory, CBT uh, medication, uh, but placebos actually have to do this effect, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, we won't go into that since that's not the purpose of this uh, uh, talk, but I think it has some interesting implications if we can probably discuss that and ask you why. Um, so, but there is that tension between these kinds of things, and the dilemma then for professional psychology is not that it has too many strengths, but we don't have a way of integrating and keeping them together, and they become then factions that compete exclusive thought. So that, uh, so starting with our first dilemma, what's the role of research and measurement in the training of uh, professional psychology? And uh, that was the, the our first dilemma that we talked about, and represented probably the largest division, and that the scientific method is one that uh, we generally espouse as being uh, the, the foundation for psychology. And the Boulder Conference and the Vail Conference reflect, the, the Boulder Conference uh, in 1949, reflected that emphasis on science and research as the underlying foundation. Uh, but then came the Vail Conference in 73 that then said, wait a minute, we're training clinical psychologists to be practitioners. We're not training them to be researchers. So therefore, while we may be, in, uh, they ought to be informed by the science rather than uh, be scientists and researchers. And that was a, one of the biggest shifts that accounted for the creation of NCSBP um, in terms of professional schools and professional uh, programs and decided to put you know, emphasis. And it plays itself out in terms of what are your requirements you know, for uh, dissertation, courses, and other kinds of things. And uh, um, but, that's, but that's a growing controversy. And even within the science practitioner models, there's a growing controversy because there are some within we don't think it's enough. It's not enough science. And that actually threatens a lot of the science practitioner program. And they become polarized in terms of the opposing um, piece. So, the, um, <coughs> so it's a question of how do you emphasize the research skills that you learn in your program versus the clinical skills that you need to learn in your program. And how much time do you develop in the curriculum to one or the other and both. And that sometimes uh, that is not an easy challenge because of, uh, you know, there's only so much time you want to get out in time to be able to practice rather than to be trained for the rest of, uh, the rest of your, your life. So that, uh, okay, so, uh, <coughs> so practitioners that face these uh, gaps because our, our dominant research paradigm tends to yield data more about homogeneous majority groups receiving standard treatment and all. And that, uh, so the question of this, uh, this uh, polarity is how do we include all of these elements in our training to reflect clinical skill, the cultural acceptability of these uh, methods to uh, the people that we're providing the services you know, because we may have a certain persuasion or you know a way of, of practice, but if it doesn't have the credibility and uh, uh, 
without clients, then also that's a problem. And then how do we inform that by research? So that, um, so that the real question is how do we socialize future generations of training? So let me get to then the, the second dilemma, is should professional psychologists of the future be trained to practice beyond the scope of individual therapy and assessment? That's a, a, a major dilemma because um, there is often the sense in training programs that um, we're here to train clinicians. And oftentimes, that training is limited to individual psychotherapy, not family therapy, couples therapy, group therapy, and so on. They're given much lower uh, attention. So, so then you have uh, marriage and family therapist programs who focus on family and marriage and family therapy, you know, because they feel it's not enough. And people often get their training in these other modalities outside of their training program, post, you know, post degree. Uh, if we in fact believe that there ought to be a public health uh, mission to the role of psychologists, this gets back to the issue of identity, then how do you play that out in what you do? And if you limit it only to individually seeing, and it's not, there's anything wrong with that, but if you limit it to seeing individuals one-on-one, -on -one, uh, how do you take into consideration is your context, is your family, is your community, and all those kinds of things. Uh, and again, it boils down to how much time you have in the curriculum to begin to include all of those kinds of issues. And, um, and there is then the belief that we need to expand that, that you know, especially in the context of healthcare reform, especially in the context of now our emphasis of prevention and public health, you know, that, uh, that psychologists um, are increasingly practicing in different kinds of settings, which I'll discuss a little more when we talk about internships, you know, and that if psychologists are in fact practicing in different kinds of settings, including forensic and, um, you know, hospitals and healthcare, general healthcare, and, and so on. Then they need a different set of skills that may go, in fact, beyond that of the individual. So that you've seen at times when individual or psychologists trained in an individual modality go then and consult to corporations. And they're speaking a language that's based on pathology, that's based on um, methods that the corporation is saying, when First of all, I don't want to be labeled as such, but also that's not helping me with my business. And yet if we're saying psychology should have impact on these vast areas, we also need to look at them, what are the skills that we provide. So that, um, so that's more lots of expanding our way. Of, uh, so the third dilemma is um, one of how can professional psychology assure that there's adequate practical training for clinical school health and counseling. And what's not even included in that is organizational, because that's increasingly being viewed as uh, currently life insurance is limited to clinical school and counseling. And that, but organizational side is thinking, well, maybe we should get licensed, <coughs> you know, and maybe we ought to require a license for protection. But that, how do we ensure the practical uh, uh, training when, in fact, uh, the, we see internships uh, being reduced? You know, the, the internship crisis, you know, is one that I'm sure you face to some extent. You know, the, and most acutely in New York recently, the closing or the union um, issue regarding intern that affected intern placements, you know, in which they, some interns, uh, there's a reprieve now, but some interns may no longer be able to uh, practice in the intern setting that they have. Now, there may be a short-term fix, but the long-term issue is, how does the service delivery system look at the use of psychology? And that increasingly within the service delivery system uh, is that the increased use of, of non-doctoral level uh, clinicians, which in 
include social workers, which include master's level you know, uh, clinicians, marriage and family therapists, mental health counselors, and so on. And we have not been very good about grappling with that as a role in terms of what does that mean? And that, um, uh, so the prediction, you know, could be, what will it mean for uh, doctoral level psychologists in the next decade? Will you no longer be able to find a job? Because they don't want to hire you because you are too expensive, overtrained, you know, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm saying that, you know, uh, partly because I certainly hope that, that that's not become the case, but this is the thing you have to grapple with. If we don't grapple with these kinds of issues in defining the scope of practice and the level of uh, entry and all of these kinds of things, um, it's not just about the internships, you know, that the, the internship is only the beginning because the kinds of internships that are uh, not available. <coughs> I think there's a 75 percent match rate within the uh, nationally in terms of internships. That, in other words, if you go through APIC, which is the main uh, uh, body through which students apply for internship, the match rate is 75 percent. That means one quarter of the class are likely to not match. Now there are other options. You know, um, and the match usually means an accredited internship. You know, but one of the problems is it's very difficult, more difficult for people to uh, programs that don't follow the traditional mold to get accredited as an internship. So it doesn't mean that it's not a good internship potentially. It's just not what they're going to accredit. And APA makes it difficult to uh, accredit. And when I say APA makes it difficult. Who's APA? APA is us, you know, so that uh, it makes it difficult to accredit new programs because they don't follow the traditional mold. And the traditional mold has come from the clinical psychology vantage point where they're based in hospitals and psychiatric settings and uh, outpatient psychiatric, uh, uh, and I use psychiatric deliberately because uh, that's where it started. And the, the, the internships that are closing are ones that have that kind of base. Because I was in um, Massachusetts for 30 years, and the premier internship program in the Boston area was at Beth Israel, and it closed out. Yeah. And it, it reflected those dimensions. It was money, it was um, you know, a host of things. But what we don't do is, how do we find and create those internships that will train, and that's been the biggest argument of the PsyD and professional schools, is that, because um, uh, that's, that's been one of the controversies, is you're taking in too many students. And the argument has been, but we take in the students in areas that science practitioner programs or you know, uh, these programs are not training. We're not, they're not training them for the range of settings and the range of options that a psychologist can and should be training. And that's been the balance of the argument. So that we do need to look at the internship shortage. You know, that's what uh, it's been called an internship crisis. It's been called um, a, a lot of different names. And that inherent in those names has been the notion of accusation towards one or the other group about who's done wrong in terms. What hasn't been looked at is uh, how do we assess where these internships should be, how do we create them, and how do we accredit them in ways that doesn't meet the barriers. The school systems have a big difficulty getting an accredited internship because you need to have a certain core of psychologists in the setting. Domestic violence status, for example, has difficulty um, getting because of the cost, but also because you don't usually have three psychologists in a domestic violence setting. And if you're talking about providing needed psychological services in these kinds of settings, you may also need to look at how you enable you know, quality internships to be done. And, and, and we currently don't have the structures in our minds, both as a profession, you know, 
to be able to think in those ways to enable that, and it gets into fighting, um, you know, the, the fights between the factions. So that, um, okay, so the, the dilemma four is, what kind of doctors are we anyway? You know, uh, are we specialty training? You know, the whole issue of uh, the neurosciences and neuropsychology has grown tremendously over the last decade or so. You know, we have tests, we have um, uh, brain scans, we have many uh, uh, measures that are much more sophisticated uh, uh, in terms of being able to get at some of the cognitive, intellectual, you know, um, uh, neuropsychological functioning than we did before. And that, so it's grown tremendously out of the field. It's linked then with measurement much more. And uh, whereas at one point in your training that required just the use of a whisk or a bent gestalt, you know, a whisk and waist of bent gestalt to be what we learned, what we, what we measured in terms of cognitive functioning and neural, neurological problems, we now have much more and those things are not sufficient. You know, so that the whole question of it being a specialty in and of itself, you know, is again one that how many programs really are able to incorporate the kind of depth and complexity of training uh, within, quote, a generic uh, training program. Uh, forensic is another area where that is, is true. And the issue of prescription privileges is one that has been a major controversy over the last decade or two in that, um, there are those who say, we never wanted to be medical doctors, we never wanted to be physicians that prescribe pills, so what right, and what, why should we be considering that? And those who say, but if you look at the fact that 70% uh, or so of the prescriptions for um, psychotropic drugs are done in primary care settings by physicians, then who have no training, in mental health and uh, psychological issues, then shouldn't we be doing something there in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of prescription privileges? Now, I had run a community health center um, for about 10 years way back, and that uh, in order to, we had a mental health department in there, so it was, um, it was an instance of um, some of this integrated care and all, and that our mental health department, we had social workers, we had psychologists, and we, we had psychiatrists as consultants who would come in really once a month to prescribe, uh, especially when we had the severely mentally ill, and they did the meds, you know, and so on. And from my standpoint, that was where I started to think. You know, if they were prescription privileges, I probably would go for them. Why? Because the psychiatrist had, often didn't have a clue because it, because he was expensive. You know, he would give the meds to like, what, 20 people in an hour? <laughs> you know, and so the, the, the quality, and the, but you needed that signature, and you needed that um, endorsement because psychologists can't prescribe medicine. And it was the social workers and the psychologists who were doing all the therapy. So it raises the question of, What's the reason for prescribing, you know, uh, uh, for prescribing, you know, pills and, and so on? And it's not to try to be a mini, you know, MD, but it's it's other questions within the delivery of care within the system. Unfortunately, that controversy still rages uh, strong, and there are people on both sides of it, and it's been. Uh, it's only been about well, two states, I think, in the country that have uh, that have a law in place to allow for prescription privileges for psychologists. So that that's uh, again, you know, one of these. And I uh, emphasize with the growing, with the emergence of healthcare reform, there are what's currently in place is or being talked about or being developed is it hasn't been developed is accountable care or that's going to drive, that's what all the hospitals and so on in New York, as well as everywhere else, is trying to form. It's a new, in my mind, 
mind. It's a new form of managed care. You know, and it's an attempt to try to look at it, not from an insurance side, but from a uh, service side. And it's going to come, you know, come together in terms of creating the rules and regulations and the structures for how services, health and mental health services will be delivered. So there are some who say, uh, I want to work in a hospital setting. I want to do psychotherapy, you know, in a 50-minute hour. I can't do that in a hospital or a healthcare setting. And but if that's if these accountable care organizations are going to be driving reimbursement, and it will, then the thing is that if you want to opt out of um, insurance reimbursement and do a practice, you can. But you're not, but you, you won't be able to be reimbursed for services unless you consider we as a role of psychologists are going to be in these kind of accountable care organizations. And if you look at where our current systems are going or exist, whereby psychologists are not the leaders. I, that's why my interest in leadership <laughs> is psychologists are not the leaders in our, our public um, uh, mental health service delivery system. It is your social workers, you know, and other professions, um, and therefore psychologists are not driving the, the, the not driving the train. So that it, you have an opportunity within accountable care organizations to begin to shape the role of psychologists in terms of driving what the reimbursement and driving what the service delivery is going to look like, you know, and. Um, and, and that's where, where, if it mirrors the silos and the kinds of things that I, I, we see in the profession that's being argued, where you, the argument about license and all this rests at the level of the doctoral level, ignoring the fact that the majority of school psychologists are not doctoral. And the majority, and there are many mental health uh, uh, counselors and professionals at the master's level, and because we just we don't allow them to be members of APA as a full member. They now create their own organizations and they create their own accrediting bodies through PAPRA that then says, we don't allow you to supervise us. You're not qualified, even though you have a doctorate and we have a master's, you're not qualified because you're not accredited as a mental health counselor. And they deliberately do um, having these kinds of rules. And why? You know, my opinion actually is because we ignored that fact. We didn't allow them in. We didn't work with them. We didn't collaborate with, with them. We didn't recognize them by allowing them to even use the type of psychologist. So if you look at nursing, for example, you have nurses who are LPNs, uh, RNs, nurse practitioners, you know, uh, physician assistants, all the way through a scope that defines what do you do at each of these levels? Do you change bedpans? Or do you prescribe pills? You know, do you do an intake? Can you do a diagnosis? Not every nurse can, but they're all called nurses. So they don't separate out. We haven't done that in psychology. You know, so that, um, so these are the kinds of things that we have to address in, in, uh, in that. And I said a little about school psychologists already. Um, but that's the next dilemma is what is their place within professional psychology. The fact that, um, that uh, the majority of school psychologists at the MA level, much fewer at the doctoral level, and that APA, the huge fight within APA, APA Council of Representatives about licensure on one little clause within the uh, Model Licensing Act that said uh, that exempted school psychologists from being able to call themselves psychologists within the school set. And uh, that was a huge argument and, uh, uh, and a huge anger between groups, you know, of talking about diluting the degree and all of this kind of stuff. But uh, we have to recognize the reality that uh, uh, there, there are school systems, there are training, you know, within school psychology that uh, is addressed, needs to be addressed, and if we have these kinds of actions, we need to be able to achieve some better solutions for how to uh, have a place for uh, psychologists
just doing different kinds of things, and we have to define it. It's not all the same, you know, and that and the argument is presumed on you're all asking for the same, you know. So um, let's see. Dilemma six was uh, what should the standards be licensing and accrediting of psychology in the U.S. and the world? Now I don't know how many of you are aware that. Uh, the U.S. is one of the few countries in the world that license uh, that the entry level for practice is at the doctoral level. Most of the other countries, first of all, you know, the psychology is more advanced in the U.S. I mean, we've been around longer, we've been doing more and all. But in country, other countries throughout the world, either they don't have any regulation, which is a problem, yeah, or it's regulated and uh, the, the entry levels at the master's level. You know, and they're, they're, uh, it's, uh, it can be quite complicated in that, you know, because in, in Mexico, for example, it's almost at the bachelor's level, but then the number of years you need to get there is really equivalent to a master's, you know, so I won't go into all those kinds of details. But if you look at that, what does that mean then for uh, people trained other countries when they come here to practice, we don't allow that. You know, they have to go through re-specialization, they have to demonstrate that doctor, they have to do many things. We don't allow it. But the thing is that it raises the question of mobility and uh, licensure because with the growing internet age, of the, it raises two things. One is what I was saying about the master's level, is that uh, if we don't allow anybody, anything, you know, until, you know, and, and we only define it very narrowly as independent practice at the doctoral level, then what happens to all these others who are going to take jobs and will be practicing? They're just going to find it in ways that are not going to be, because uh, they don't meet these rules, they'll find others. So we have Nick coming to you, who's been a controversial figure in, um, in psychology, but also quite an entrepreneur and innovative thinker. He started managed care, you know, and then went on to criticize it for uh, it being bad. Uh, but he created a new doctoral program in behavioral, I forgot what they call it, it's a doctoral behavioral something or that. The issue is, he's not going for accreditation from APA, because it's not psychology, psychology but he's training them to do all the things in a healthcare setting as a gatekeeper, as a, you know, that you might find a psychologist doing. So that uh, people have criticized him, but then he says that uh, I'm only creating something that nobody, you know, psychologists don't want to do. So the thing is that that's where the, the role is how the psychologist begins to think about uh, expanding your role to do the, you know, a broader range of things. Not everybody wants to be a neuropsychologist, but how do we create the, the field in a way that recognizes that? So that the, the other aspect of uh, standards and, and so on is the issue of technology and telehealth and telemedicine, uh, telepsychology, as they now talk about it. And that increasingly within the net and so on, there are people doing psychotherapy online. And a good colleague of mine, I'm sure the deeper is that uh, uh, does do psychotherapy online, but is very acutely aware and focused on the ethics of it. You know, how do you address the ethics? You know, uh, how do you address the ethics and the, the, the licensure of crossing state boundaries? Because currently, uh, licensure is state-based. You are licensed in New York, and therefore you practice in New York. But the scenarios that have been coming up is, what about you, you're doing therapy with uh, someone who uh, is uh, you know, in the corporate uh, uh, sector, and he has to travel a lot. And he's going to another country, he's often away, but he wants to continue therapy. Can you do that? Can you? communicate with him via technology, Skype, uh, which is not secure, but, uh, uh, but can you communicate with him via technology, uh, phone or other kind of methods, so that he can continue his, his um, what he needs and do it ethically, and do it without violating your, your license, you know, and so currently it's not really clear that you can, you know, and that uh, because you're supposed to cannot uh, practice across state lines. Uh, and, and increasingly mobile uh, society.
we don't, New York is the only one of the three states maybe that doesn't have mobility. You know, most of the states do. You know, so that uh, uh, New York is really behind the times in that regard because they don't allow people that have thought to come in to practice even though they've had credentials and so on that were, you know, uh, would, would be defined as, you know, fine. You know, when you come in, you have to do it all over again. You know, that's a problem. You know, and in a, in a, in a more technological world, that increasingly becomes a problem. So we, we need to figure out ways to address those kinds of issues and to, in a way that enables us not to be uh, constricted by, in our practice, you know, uh, and, uh, and always figuring out when we're violating to the other way, and it's it's not, so it's not a matter of, not igno of ignoring standards and quality and all of that, but addressing it in the new age. And the, uh, so the seventh dilemma then is uh, the uh, mission for the money, is that uh, uh, I raised that question about the debt load and, and that who do we serve, but well, one of the issues about mission or money is that when we start talking about underserved populations and communities and uh, minority communities, we also talk about issues of poverty, socioeconomic status, uh, you know, class, and all of that, in which the access uh, to care is uh, is more limited by virtue of you know socioeconomic status, by virtue of cultural factors that. Uh, language and culture and so on, and that, uh, and oftentimes uh, the, the underserved are coming in to the public sector and where the payment for services, they're not the ones that are coming into the private practice because they don't have the money to do so. So therefore, uh, do we have a public service uh, mission uh, and how do we reach that in, within the preventive framework that may not even be therapy. You know, and, uh, and with the changing demographics and so on, we need to pay attention to those kinds of issues in order to ensure the inclusiveness of the benefits of our services to all populations. And that, um, okay, so, and then the last dilemma is um, how can we best harness technology for psychological um, services? You know, there are many things with healthcare, again, with healthcare reform, there are things that actually go beyond the services. You know, there are electronic medical records, and uh, I come back from uh, one of these meetings recently, and we're talking, you know, about the electronic medical records. Well, it's geared towards a medical uh, delivery of medical services, because what has historically happened in medical records in general is the fact that the mental health records are subset, and they're considered confidential, so that not everybody has access to it. You know, how do you do that within the new system of electronic medical records? Who has access, who decides access, and the issue of the right to information and all raises some huge problems in terms of what part of uh, your notes would be constitute part of the record. And so, so that's one you know, major area in terms of the issues of technology. Um, and then in terms of harnessing it through uh, uh, the, 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 the notion of services have, becomes vague in terms of, we can talk about online therapy, but we're still talking about therapy. Well, what about all these sites that purport to be helping, you know, the wikis, the blogs, and all of these things? What are the credentials of the people who have given the advice? You know, and how do we address that within ethics and standards and so on? And increasingly, there are lots of people out there who are reporting their expertise in these areas. Um, some of them won't, won't, don't call themselves psychologists, you know, but they, uh, you know, they are giving the kind of advice that uh, within our profession is regulated. And uh, since they don't call themselves psychologists, we can't regulate them. You know, uh, but many of those exist out there, and it's a vast area, the whole social networking and so on, and the harm that could occur with that, that we just don't have the rules for dealing with. You know, and 
said, because uh, they have many self-help websites. Like I know, I became aware of this uh, website on anorexia. There's actually many of them, you know, and uh, they're called pro anor websites, and uh, and it deals with this whole issue of anorexia, which sometimes even supports, you know, the continuation, you know, provides support to the individuals, but yet, you know, there's some real risk involved in all of that, and that so that if you're seeing somebody in your office. And, um, you know, but that same person is going to these websites and dealing with all of that. Sometimes the competing demands of the, the power of those websites can be much greater than the power of your, you know, of the therapy that you're providing. And uh, so we need to, again, address all those issues with technology, which is vast. And, and that a lot of times there's also the stigma associated with the use of technology as, oh, it couldn't be good, it's all bad, you know, and that, uh, because we don't know how to use it, right? So that, and we don't grapple with those kinds of issues, you know, the younger ones, uh, the, the, the younger generation, that, that probably applies to most of you in the room, is probably more open to that. But uh, the dichotomy between that and, um, you know, some of the older generation who said, I don't know, I don't know, I can't touch this, I don't know how to do it with this, you know, can be daunting and can influence what goes on then in terms of your curriculum and all. So we really have to address these questions. How do we best harness the technology? And let me, um, pull, and this, because this is what we did, to pull it together with, um, okay, with all these dilemmas, what, what do we do? You know, what is it all about? And as a group, what we felt is, as I said, we started with the issue of our identity as psychologists, to keep that foremost. And if we can keep that foremost, we can then try to come, you know, deal with these different factions and try to address the dilemmas in a way that would advance the field and would lead us to a place that uh, enables to practice in the future. The other, in concluding with that, we felt the same about the common values for professional psychologists, that there are techniques, there are things that uh, will change no matter what, but if we can subscribe to what some of the core values that we believe are important in terms of uh, what professional psychology is about, that's what will enable, and that's what enabled us as a group to write an article you know, with very different perspectives, coming from very different perspectives, and to write it together, you know, with something that we could um, uh, all agree to and embrace. And so, so some of these common values is, uh, is that uh, psychology is a science that's grounded in research and systematic effort. You know, that we could all accept that as, uh, as an important value. That critical thinking skills should be central to the training of uh, professional psychologists. And these are skills that we don't always, we don't have a course on critical thinking, you know, but is critical thinking important to the formulation in terms of assessment, in terms of, yes it is. So how do you do that? Um, the reassessment of accountable standards for accreditation uh, warranted with consequences for programs that regularly fail to place students. That was a very specific because that, and it, it falls on the heel, heels of what APA and APIC is talking about, is that, um, uh, and deals with the argument of, uh, are you taking in too many students? And uh, I've had my science practitioner program uh, colleagues, you know, say uh, that one of the recommendations was, if you can't place all your students, then you decrease the number of students. Science practitioner model says we only accept four students. If I can decrease it, you know, by one, that's 25% of my program. Okay, is that you know that's very different than a program that takes 100 students and you decrease it by 10. Okay, so so it's not a simple answer, and that what they're saying that how do we monitor and regulate? And it's been a, a real thorn to try to figure that out, but. Um, but, but the argument is uh, we really do need to look at what the standards are and to address that within the complexity of some of those things. And to recognize the important role of medical settings in psychology training and how professional psychologists are especially equipped to lead efforts towards a critical role of prevention and healthcare. So 
So it's healthcare, and I've heard uh, many colleagues tell me that I want to work in a hospital. You know, so what's this thing about healthcare reform? And, and they're shoving it down our throats. You know, so that's one. Uh, you know, that's one extreme of that. But I think I would also point to the reality is this is what all the reimbursement is going to be all about. So that uh, you can choose not to do it, but you have to know what the consequences are. And considering the important role of schools in the public mission of serving children and establishing a dialogue between those practicing in the schools with an eye to a better public service, and that's a school psychology issue, and um, a dialogue should be extended internationally two psychologists with different backgrounds and credentials to go out research and practice with an international reform cross-cultural framework um, that recognizing increasing globalization and all that. There was a trilateral forum that was developed between Mexico, Canada, and the US, 